The Ministry of Public Security of the People's Republic of China is the wing of the Chinese government that today manages everyday police on the street law enforcement. But from its creation in the wake of the communist victory during the Chinese Civil War in 1949 until the year 1983, when the Ministry of State Security was established, it was also responsible for domestic and international intelligence operations fighting espionage efforts from foreign and local entities of the state, and, during the Cold War especially, fomenting revolution around the world by spreading ideological information and funneling weapons, money, and other resources to pro-Chinese and pro-communist regimes and groups elsewhere. From 1983 onward, though, the Ministry of State Security took over most of those spy-related activities, allowing the Ministry of Public Security to focus primarily on at-home policing efforts. China being a one-party state, though, which keeps order in part through strict surveillance and security practices, taking down anyone who might threaten the status quo's stability and who might mess with the plans of the people in charge of that single party. Their policing efforts are a bit more expansive than those that you are likely to find elsewhere. One of their policing responsibilities, for example, is running what's called the Golden Shield Project, also called the National Public Security Work Informational Project, which is a collection of integrated systems that plug security management infrastructure into criminal information systems, exit and entry informational systems, traffic management systems, and a collection of tools that allow those in control of the Golden Shield to compile and mesh disparate information quickly, using various surveillance and database apparatuses to recognize a face in the crowd, attach that face to all the information about the person who wears it, and then hobble that person's ability to do bad things or escape police if they're a threat to society and need to be brought in. And that's according to the Chinese government's definition for threat to society, at least. The Golden Shield Project is just one of 12 golden projects, all of which are related to some vital aspect of societal development. The Golden Card Project, for example, is related to the development and management of electronic currencies, while the Golden Water Project is related to water conservation. The Golden Shield Project gets outsized attention, though, especially outside of China, because it is attached to the famous Great Firewall of China, a project that the MPS ostensibly runs, though that's apparently never been formally declared. It's just sort of an understood relationship that the government benefits in some way from not acknowledging officially. The Great Firewall of China is so well known because it's what allows the Chinese government to censor the local internet which it's able to accomplish by utilizing a collection of tools that help human censors more easily and efficiently strip out banned words and images, limit access to select foreign information sources, block foreign-made tools like Google Search, Facebook, Wikipedia, and Twitter, block foreign mobile apps, and it helps them implement these limitations to a high level of success so that any foreign entity that wants to operate within the country must abide by Chinese regulations, which means generally giving all of their source code and other secrets to the Chinese government to check over. And reportedly, at least, they will then often share that information with their own local Chinese-grown competitors. And in addition, to generally allow the Chinese government to have the final say as to what makes it into a particular app or website, if you want that app or website to exist within the geographic boundaries of their country. Part of why this collection of tools and systems is called the Great Firewall is because of the historical context of the region. The Great Wall of China is a fixture in local culture, but also quite famous worldwide. Beyond that, though, it's also just a very impressive and seemingly quite effective piece of infrastructure, the likes of which the rest of the world didn't really think was possible. The internet was a place where information wanted to be free, after all. But the Chinese managed to build it, nonetheless, allowing their people to benefit from many of the same privileges enabled by the internet elsewhere, without also exposing their people to the many challenging and uncomfortable ideas that came with the internet, 
a state of affairs that some authoritarian states are weaponizing against their more democratic and open information touting kin in other countries by utilizing misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation delivered via these same channels. Democratic governments are highly susceptible to these types of false facts and insinuations, while countries that censor the internet are relatively more protected from it, as they can just ban anything they like without the public having any means of calling them on it, or even necessarily knowing that it's happening much of the time. This firewall they built, despite being a very impressive wall, was for a very long time just a wall. It was for defensive purposes, and it gave them very clear advantages within their own borders. It was disconcerting to the rest of the world, but not anything that anyone thought they could do much about, or even needed to do anything about. It sucked for the Chinese people, the thinking went, but I guess that's their prerogative. They built the wall. In 2015, though, a new capability of the Golden Shield was unveiled when China used a bundle of tools that collectively became known as the Great Cannon of China. This cannon was actually a means of launching distributed denial-of-service attacks, or DDoS attacks, against foreign entities that they deemed to be harmful to what they are trying to accomplish. In March of 2015, they fired this cannon against, among other targets, the pseudo-social network slash software sharing and forking site GitHub, because GitHub provided tools that allowed civilians anywhere, including in China, to access censorship evasion capabilities, allowing Chinese citizens to see past the Great Firewall if they chose to do so. What this canon did, in essence, was reroute web browsers visiting Chinese-based websites so that they were visiting sites like GitHub or others like Great Fire, which also hosted anti-censorship software that people could use to get around the Great Firewall, and blanketed those sites with traffic, millions upon millions of visitors an hour for weeks on end. This made it impractical for the sites to remain online, which is the entire purpose of a DDoS attack. If you cannot actually take a website off the internet, you make it unvisitable because it's busy trying to load assets for this fake browser traffic that is being shot at it in such numbers by the cannon. This event was notable, not because it was devastating to GitHub and other sites. It wasn't great for them, but they still exist today, and there are plenty of ways to avoid the Great Firewall still, if you look around a little. It is notable, though, because it's the first time that China attempted on that scale, to enforce its censorship standards on entities beyond its borders. Rather than keeping its word and image and information banning practices within its own walls, it tried to extend its walls around other pieces of the web, weaponizing fundamental pieces of internet infrastructure to do so. Today, because of how the internet has evolved, but also because of how international politics are evolving, we're seeing the same ambitions being pursued in very different ways. What I'd like to talk about today is cultural economics, soft power, and China's new great canon. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. All patrons at any level gain an additional episode of the show each month, in addition to other smaller benefits. But in becoming a patron, you also help contribute to the perpetuation of this show. A huge thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show in some way. I truly appreciate that. Thank you. And another quick note, starting in November of 2019, I have a new project that I will be publishing, which you might enjoy if you enjoy this show. It's called Brain Lenses, and it is an email-based publication, so essays delivered to your inbox, on subjects related to concepts and ideas and tendencies that bend and shape and bias the way that we think. If that's something that sounds like it's in your wheelhouse, pop on over to brainlenses.com to subscribe. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from the Washington Post, and it's entitled 
China slams arrogant and dangerous United States over Hong Kong democracy bill as city's dysfunction deepens. This story takes place on the international stage, involves a lot of politicians, a large number of brands, and massive amounts of trade revenue. But it begins, or rather this chapter of the bigger story it's a part of, begins in early October of 2019, when the general manager for an American basketball team, the Houston Rockets, named Daryl Morey, tweeted an image containing the slogan, Fight for Freedom, Stand with Hong Kong. That tweet went out on October 4th, with relatively little fanfare. This guy is known within the sports world, but he is not a widely known figure outside of the NBA, the National Basketball Association, the organization that manages the biggest basketball league in North America, and probably the best-known basketball league in the world. Later that same day, the owner of the Houston Rockets tweeted that Mori doesn't speak for the team, and that they are not a political organization. They are in Tokyo to promote the NBA around the world, not to say or do anything related to Hong Kong, or politics, or anything else. Two days later, the Chinese Basketball Association announced that they would suspend all cooperation with the Houston Rockets, urging the U.S.-based team to clarify their position and correct their mistakes immediately. That same day, CCTV5, which is the sports channel on China's most popular television network, announced they would stop broadcasting Houston Rockets games in the country. And about 600 million people watched NBA games in China in 2018 to give a numerical indication of why that's such a substantial blow. Finally, Tencent, one of China's biggest and wealthiest tech companies, with its fingers in artificial intelligence, apps, and entertainment and media services, announced that they would stop streaming Houston Rockets games on their platforms and would not be reporting on those games either. And on their networks, about 500 million people watched NBA games in 2018. So Houston Rockets basketball games would sort of just disappear on the majority of Chinese media platforms. That following Monday, October 7th, the NBA made a sort of apology to China, saying that they recognized that Maury's tweet deeply offended, quote, many of our friends and fans in China, end quote. Maury also tweeted out a sort of apology, saying that he did not intend his ostensible support for Hong Kong protesters to offend fans of the team in China or his own personal friends in China, and that he'd been considering many other perspectives on the matter in the meantime, implying that he had been tweeting based on incomplete information and may have changed his mind since the whole PR snafu started, though he didn't outright say that. U.S. politicians swept in to criticize this response, describing the organization's sort of apologies as kowtowing to China, kowtowing referring to a Cantonese term for the showing of deep respect for someone by getting on the floor and bowing all the way down, down on all fours, pressing your head to the ground. It's considered to be the highest demonstration of reverence and showing your inferiority to someone else, and it's often reserved for royalty in some traditional Chinese and East Asian societies. So the implication being made by U.S. politicians here is that by apologizing to China, which reacted quite quickly and harshly to an implied lack of solidarity with its government-mandated party line on the issue of Hong Kong from a business partner operating out of another country, they were implying that those U.S.-based business partners had decided to give up their support for the freedom of speech in order to make a quick buck in China. The issue did not stop there, though, much to the NBA's chagrin. The next day, October 8th, the commissioner of the NBA, a man named Adam Silver, released a statement saying that he would not censor any players or team owners on the issue of China or anything else, saying that the freedom of expression was more important than money. So, quote, the NBA will not put itself in a position of regulating what players, employees, and team owners say or will not say, end quote. He went on to say, later in that same statement, quote, I do know there are consequences from freedom of speech. We will have to live with those consequences. For those who question our motivations, this is about far more than growing our business, end quote. U.S. politicians seemed to be at least a little bit satisfied with this sentiment, but Chinese officials were very much not pleased. In response to Silver's statement, CCTV 
that biggest of TV networks in China, released their own statement, saying that they had decided to immediately cease broadcasting the NBA's preseason matches in China because of Silver's statement about Mori's tweet. The broadcaster also indicated that they would be reviewing their overall relationship with the NBA because, quote, we believe any remarks that challenge national sovereignty and social stability do not belong to this category of free speech, end quote. Tencent, that massive Chinese tech and media company, said that they would also cancel their plans to stream some of the NBA preseason games in China. The day after that, October 9th, all 11 official Chinese partners of the NBA suspended their ties with the company, including fast food chains, travel websites, and skincare brands. So these were companies that were advertising with the NBA, doing cross-promotional work, but also those that were working to sell tickets to games, sponsoring teams, broadcasting events, and so on. Other Chinese companies that were not directly working with the NBA, but which had some ties, even if just adjacent ones, also sounded off with condemnation for the league, saying that they could not support false remarks like those made by the organization, and that they would not deal with the NBA again in the future because of their position on this matter. Much of this story took place in the first few weeks of October, but a few reverberations were not felt until later in the month. NBA Commissioner Silver, for instance, publicly claimed that the Chinese government wanted him to fire Houston Rockets general manager, Mori, the guy who tweeted, and that Silver had told them no, which was part of why China was so angry about this whole ordeal. He had refused a direct order from a group of people who were accustomed to having their orders obeyed. CCTV, the big Chinese television network, published a piece on the 18th of October saying that Silver was lying about this supposed demand from the Chinese government, and that he had, quote, fabricated lies out of thin air, end quote, in making this claim. They also said, somewhat eerily, that Silver would face, quote, retribution sooner or later, end quote, for making up this lie, and that he had done so to, quote, cater to the tastes of certain American politicians, end quote. So, a few contextual items before we go any further. First, is that the Hong Kong references in the NBA story are about the protests that have been taking place in the city since March 2019. Those protests were initially a response to a piece of legislation called the Fugitive Offenders Amendment Bill, which was proposed by the Hong Kong government, a government that was installed by the mainland Chinese government, by the way, since Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China. But this was a bill that pissed Hong Kong citizens off because they are meant to have a separate legal system from that of mainland China under the auspices of a deal made with the United Kingdom when Hong Kong was released back into Chinese custody after a century and a half of British control. This bill was basically a thinly veiled extradition bill, meaning that China could, in practice, get the Hong Kong government to send anyone they wanted from Hong Kong to mainland China to face legal punishments there, rather than under Hong Kong law, which is substantially different from that of China's and broadly a lot more democratic and transparent. There is rule of law there, rather than just the rule of the party. Though these protests began in March of 2019, they became a true mass movement in June, with over half a million people marching to stop the bill from passing. And although the chief executive of Hong Kong did not give in to the pressure on that day, an escalation in violence, mostly but not exclusively by the police against the protesters, led to a stall in the legal process, and the bill was not passed. Mid-June, another massive march took place, before being broken up by gas and rubber bullet firing police. And at this march, the protesters shifted their attention from just the extradition bill to also focus on the excessive use of force by the police in the previous march. Many people were injured quite severely, and hundreds of thousands to millions of people, depending on whose numbers you trust, marched to show their opposition to how the police and the government were operating. After that, government buildings were vandalized, protests continued, and continued to be broken up by aggressive weapon-wielding police. 
Protesters demonstrated in many colorful ways, aiming to get international attention for their cause, but also to rally more Hong Kong citizens to their side, a side that had formalized its demands to include five points instead of just the original single point. So although they still had a focus on maintaining their governmental separation from mainland China and other associated freedoms that come with that division, they also wanted to launch an independent inquiry into violence by police and wanted the protesters that had been jailed along the way to be freed as well. The extradition bill was suspended mid-June and declared dead at the beginning of July. The bill was formally pulled from consideration in late October. But as of the day I'm recording this, the last week of October, protests are still ongoing, with the government escalating the force that they seem to be willing to use against protesters, banning face masks in the city, and trying to keep people from gathering in groups of more than a few people, and protesters gaining an increasing amount of international attention at the same time and seemingly embarrassing a powerful government that is trying to show the world that it is the next obvious near-future superpower. And the second point I want to make before moving forward is that although it's quite likely that China did tell the NBA to fire Mori for his tweet and then lied about it through their public mouthpiece television network, it's also possible that the NBA saw an opportunity to garner political currency by towing the U.S. line on China positioning it as a bully and a bad actor in international politics, giving the NBA upper brass incentive to partially or completely fabricate a story about Chinese pressure so the United States could score diplomatic points over their perceived upstart rival. In short, only those involved know for certain what really transpired here. And I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that the NBA told a fib, just as I don't think it's at all unlikely that the Chinese government applied pressure, asymmetric or direct, and then lied about doing so. I think both sides, all sides actually, if we include the NBA alongside the US and Chinese governments, they all have something to gain from framing this situation the way that they did. And the NBA is reportedly on the line to lose somewhere between half a billion to five or six billion dollars as a consequence of lost deals in China depending on which figures we measure and how broad a brush we use to paint the NBA as an entity. That means after this tweet set off a firestorm from which they could not gracefully escape, there's a chance that someone handed the NBA a rope ladder made out of political incentives and regulatory promises, and they grabbed it and held on for dear life. Just as it's possible that they're telling the truth that a censorship-loving government in China, told a lie, concealing their attempt to censor a foreign entity, and everything is as it seems to be, with the Chinese getting angry because they were not obeyed, and then the target of their intended censorship and pressure told the media about it. That said, part of why this story is such a big story is that it occurred alongside other similar, nearly parallel, actually, narratives in which other organizations took flack from China for similar reasons but with differing responses and results. South Park, the long-running American cartoon that is not exactly known for pulling punches about anything, and which is often embroiled in some scandal or another, when they're at their best anyway, satire being satire, they ran an episode recently called Band in China, band as in rock band, as the plot revolves around some of the characters forming a band that is tapped to have a movie produced about them, but while attempting to write the film, Chinese censors keep making them change things to suit their censorious preferences. At the same time, the father of the kid who is in the band and writing the film is attempting to make connections in China so he can sell the marijuana he produces to their massive consumer market. But he's put in a gulag, essentially, with a bunch of Disney and Marvel characters who were also traveling to the country to make similar types of connections. And eventually, and spoiler alert here, sorry about that, eventually he murders Winnie the Pooh to get back on the Chinese government's good side. A nod to the fact that Winnie the Pooh is banned in China because of comparisons that have been made between the classic cartoon character and China's president, Xi Jinping. This episode addresses a lot of China-related issues, from their attempt to guide how a movie script should be written, which is something that has famously 
influenced many recent Hollywood blockbusters, including the immensely popular Avengers movies. China had to give their approval before the films were greenlit. But also the reportedly incredibly bad conditions in Chinese prison camps, where people who offend the government in myriad possible ways are sent to be punished and or re-educated, quote-unquote. The presence of all those Disney and Marvel characters mocks the massive Disney Corporation, which owns Marvel, among many other intellectual property sub-brands, for kowtowing to the Chinese censors. And it touches on how the brutality of the government in China is often at odds with the seeming silliness of their strictures. No Winnie the Pooh, because the character was used to mock the president. That serves as an example here. It's a bizarre thing if you live outside the logic bubble of an authoritarian state. But that bizarreness is supported by brutal policing, the black bagging and disappearing of people from their homes, and secretive prison camps where people are tortured, sometimes for life, for who knows what. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this episode of South Park was banned in China, followed by a ban of the whole show, and all mentions of the show behind the Great Firewall. In response, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the creators of South Park, issued a satirical apology on Twitter, which read, quote, Like the NBA, we welcome the Chinese censors into our homes and into our hearts. We, too, love money more than freedom and democracy. She doesn't look just like Winnie the Pooh at all. Tune into our 300th episode this Wednesday at 10. Long live the great communist party of China. May this autumn's sorghum harvest be bountiful. We good now, China? End quote. As of the day I'm recording this, South Park is still banned in China. So that took place around the same time as the NBA scandal, the beginning of October leading into mid-October 2019. This next facet of the larger story involves another collection of big corporations, but this time in the world of video games. The first week of October, that same week where those other issues popped up, a pro-level Hearthstone player who goes by the name Blitz Chung, Hearthstone being a digital fantasy-themed card game that you play online against other people from around the world. He was interviewed after a match on the official broadcast network for the competition, produced by Blizzard, the company that makes Hearthstone, and many other popular video games, including World of Warcraft, Diablo, Starcraft, and Overwatch. During this interview, Blitz Chung put on a mask similar to the ones being worn by protesters in Hong Kong, and said in Mandarin, quote, Liberate Hong Kong, the revolution of our age, end quote, a popular Hong Kong protest slogan. The interview stream was cut off shortly after he said those words, and the next day, Blizzard announced that Blitz Chung was banned from the tournament, would forfeit his prize money, which was several thousand dollars at that point, and was banned from all other tournaments of that kind for one year. To justify this ban, and that prize money forfeiture, they cited a tournament rule that said players cannot do anything that, quote, brings themselves into public disrepute, offends a portion or group of the public, or otherwise damages Blizzard's image, end quote. Blizzard also terminated the contract that they had with the two interviewers who had been conducting that interview, indicating that they believed the two had been encouraging Blitz Chung to say what he had said on their stream even though they ducked their heads under their desk as soon as he put on the mask to demonstrate that he was speaking just for himself and not them. Notable in this case is that Blizzard, which is a sub-brand of a company called Activision Blizzard, a large gaming conglomerate that is partially owned by Tencent, that massive Chinese technology company that I mentioned earlier, and though they only own less than 5% of the company, it's thought that in addition to Blizzard wanting to be able to continue to sell to the Chinese market and operate their tournaments in the country, it's possible that there was internal pressure from Chinese shareholders to silence any Hong Kong protest support via these immensely popular live streams, which are viewed by tens of millions of people around the world, very much including in China. Blizzard later pulled back a bit, in the aftermath of this decision, very probably in part because of the backlash that it catalyzed. They cut Blitz Chung's year-long penalty in half and paid him the prize money that he had won. The hashtag boycott Blizzard had become popular on Twitter, though, 
trending worldwide as employees of the company staged walkouts, in person and online, with World of Warcraft team leader Mark Kern posting a video of himself canceling his subscription to his own game in protest over Blizzard's actions. Blizzard employees covered portions of a statue on the company's central campus, hiding the phrases on that statue, Every Voice Matters and Think Globally, which were displayed alongside other taglines, the idea being that these employees no longer thought that their company stood for those ideas, and thus they covered them up as no longer being true. Other walkouts at Blizzard included the use of umbrellas, which were a nod to the Umbrella Revolution, a collection of protests that took place in Hong Kong in 2014, which led to a great deal of umbrella usage in the 2019 protests as well. Other live streamers, players, and gaming world voices have stopped playing or stopped supporting Blizzard games in protest over this move. But possibly the most consequential outcome of this situation has been the adoption of an Overwatch character. Overwatch being a very popular competition-level game made by Blizzard. The adoption of a character from that game named Mei, who is a Chinese native in the game, as a symbol of support for Blitzchung and for the Hong Kong protests overall. Mei is now featured on many protest signs around the world and in Hong Kong itself, and the company has struggled with a similar question to the one that China has struggled with in the case of Winnie the Pooh. When a popular character that is well-known and beloved for a great many things also becomes symbolic of something inconvenient, even when no words or slogans are included alongside that character, what do you do? In China's case, they simply banned Winnie the Pooh, but it's a less straightforward situation for Blizzard when it's one of their own characters from one of their games being used in this way. They've made their subreddit private to avoid having to ban everyone for posting pro-Hong Kong messages, and they've gotten pretty good at quickly moving cameras away at live events when someone whips out a protest sign, though in some cases they've had to just cancel events entirely when they weren't certain that they could censor fans and players as completely as they seem to want to be able to. But May is a part of Overwatch, and that means anyone who wants to dog whistle to a certain group of people showing support for things Blizzard is trying to avoid discussing and accidentally seeming to promote just has to show an image of a character from their game. And it would be very difficult for Blizzard to justify banning photography of people dressed as May, holding signs with May on those signs, or banning images that just show May being May, doing May things. Even though to some people, those images, those costumes, those signs mean a great deal more than just, here's an image of a character from that game. It's a clever bit of appropriation by the protesters, though from Blizzard's point of view, it has got to seem like an insidious and dangerous evolution of what was happening at the beginning of October. One more important point here. Blizzard representatives claim that China and Chinese influence has played no role at all in their decision in this matter. They are framing this decision as one that is meant to keep things focused on the game, meant to keep conversation within and surrounding their competitive esports from descending into chaos and abuse. Other gaming companies have been pulled into this dogpile as well, including Epic Games, a Blizzard competitor in the casual and esports gaming world, and famously the maker of Fortnite, among many other popular games. Epic announced that, unlike Blizzard, they would not ban players or content creators, like live streamers and interviewers, for political speech. Quoting a spokesperson for the company, quote, Epic supports everyone's right to express their views on politics and human rights. We wouldn't ban or punish a Fortnite player or content creator for speaking on those topics, end quote. This is in contrast to an announcement by the maker of League of Legends, another popular esports video game, Riot Games, which is a subsidiary company of Tencent, and thus completely owned by them. And Tencent, again, is that great big tech and media company based in China. And in that announcement, they said that they would not allow discussion of anything non-game related. So no discussion of religion, politics, or anything else from outside the game. The rationale being that they want to keep the tournament open and accessible to people from all walks of life, all backgrounds. And when those other issues come up, it can alienate some people who might otherwise feel welcome. Which 
isn't the craziest thing in the world. I mean, that doesn't sound wrong to me. But it's also something that perhaps conveniently sidesteps the larger issue here. And I think it's interesting to note, too, that Tencent's 40% ownership of Epic Games does not seem to have swayed Epic's announcement on this topic. They're the ones that said anyone can say anything. While Tencent's less than 5% ownership of Blizzard supposedly gave them sway in the case of that company's esports, which indicates to me quite possibly that Tencent's stake in these companies has less influence over the company's positions than some have posited, while the company's own internal decision-making procedures and their expected income from Chinese-based sources probably plays a much bigger role. In other words, it's less about Chinese entities telling them what to do, and more about people looking at where their revenue is coming from, and preemptively making decisions that they think will protect their China-related income streams. And then finally, rounding out this collection of stories, we turn to one of the largest corporations in the world, Apple, and its bending, and at times, breaking, seemingly in favor of Chinese sentiments over those of other nations. Part of why this part of the story is a story at all is that Apple has been publicly rebranding itself over the past five years or so, especially, as the anti-Google, anti-Facebook, anti-Amazon tech company, in that it respects user data, focuses on privacy, gets rid of ads, and does a lot of other things that customers seem to want more of, and something that a lot of their moves of late have seemed to reflect and double down on. The contrast to those words and many of their other actions, though, is that when it comes to China, that whole image seems to fall apart. Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, has had to tow a fine line with the Chinese government, as a huge chunk of the company's products are manufactured in Chinese factories, and either could not at the right price, or could not full stop, be produced elsewhere in the world, at least not without completely restructuring the company's complex supply chain over the course of many years. This dependency on Chinese infrastructure is part of why, it's assumed, Cook is so careful to stay on China's good side. The other part is that Apple needs Chinese consumers if they're going to keep scaling up economically, something that is increasingly important today, a moment at which smartphone sales are flagging because the majority of people in the developed world who are going to buy one already have one and the phones available are good enough to last several years. So it's no longer as easy to convince people to buy flashy, expensive new gadgets every single year, the way that the company's accountants and investors would prefer. And a dominant chunk of Apple's income stems from iPhone sales. But while that understanding has been a subtext, under many of Apple's financial decisions over the past several years, in 2019, it's become more of an overt stance, a stance that Apple does not seem to be too happy to be taking, but one that it is taking nonetheless. The most obvious instance of this slant to Apple's decision-making happened, you guessed it, at the beginning of October 2019, when the company removed an app called HK Map Live from the iOS App Store, along with the Quartz app. The former being an app that allowed users to track police activity, kind of like Waze allows you to track traffic activity, if you're familiar with that app, ostensibly to allow civilians to avoid tear gas and roadblocks being fired and set up by the police. But in practice, it also allowed protesters to avoid being rounded up by those same police. And the latter app, because Quartz, has covered the Hong Kong protests extensively and in great depth. Though importantly, the Quartz app was only pulled from the Chinese region App Store, not the worldwide App Store. This app blockage happened around the same time that Apple began to hide the Taiwanese flag emoji from users in Hong Kong. And Taiwan, for context, is kind of a potential flashpoint in the region, because some entities internationally treat it as an independent nation, while China does not consider it to be so, and even has plans to invade, missiles pointed at the island, and everything, if Taiwan ever gets too overt about claiming their independence. Now again, like with the other cases, there's a good bit of fuzziness as to what's actually happening here. It's possible that, as Apple claims, they pulled the HK Map app, not because of pressure from China, 
but because, as they claimed in a statement about the matter, concerned customers in Hong Kong were contacting Apple about the app being an issue of public safety, that violent individuals were using it to target police officers for ambush, for violence, and thus, it was a public safety issue. And when it came to removing the Quartz app and the Taiwanese flag, well, a lot of things are censored in China. You can't access Wikipedia or Google search either. So the fact that one more news source or bit of iconography was removed wasn't entirely beyond the pale. It was just a continuation of the norm. And Cook reiterated the argument that everyone operating in China seems to make that it's better to be in that space offering as much information as possible even if bits of it are censored out, than to not be there at all, leaving all information dissemination to the government. Now, I think it's possible to have serious issues with that argument, but to also see the logic of it. In any case, it's a nuanced, imperfect situation, and Apple, again, one of the wealthiest and most powerful corporate entities in the world, is having almost as much trouble navigating it as smaller and more niche entities like video game companies, sports leagues, and cartoon brands. All of which leads us to the bigger picture of this situation, the bits that tie these disparate stories together and perhaps tell us something about why they are all landing at around the same time rather than being spaced out the way that you might typically expect. Part of the reason these stories are landing right now is because of the aforementioned Hong Kong protests, their staying power, and the success protest organizers have had in getting information, photos and videos, and protest talking points out to the rest of the world. They clearly learned some lessons from the unsuccessful Umbrella Revolution in 2014, and they're making excellent use of the technologies available to them to frame this as a protest by people wanting to defend the concept of democracy at a time where there's a notable dearth of that kind of thing around the world. There's a lot of authoritarianism flaring up at the moment, particularly in the democratic world. So this bit of bravery and enthusiasm has been picked up by people who want to hold it up as a contrast to what is happening more broadly, for a variety of purposes, political, cynical, but also, at times, the ardent belief in the concept of democratic governance. It's also a story because of how China has handled these protests, the seemingly ham-fisted way in which it has spread obvious disinformation to the internal and international press, filled with clear governmental talking points, and how that version of events, painting these protests as riots and protesters as terrorists, hasn't been lapped up by journalists and other news-spreading entities the way it seems like the Chinese government may be expected they would. This could be chalked up to delusional thinking, but I think it's more likely the consequence of them having been trained with generally receptive media sources within their own orbits, people whose jobs are dependent on them just taking what they're given and towing the party line, along with a pushback externally against certain types of dis- and misinformation, which we are seeing emerge as a slow-moving aftershock following massive false information quakes that have rocked journalism and elections around the world. We've basically all been taking a masterclass on what propaganda, subtle and obvious, looks like over the past several years as a consequence of efforts by master media manipulators like Russia, and thus these relatively less subtle efforts by China seem a lot more obvious rather than the canny and skillful efforts that they may have seemed to be to everyone back in 2014, in simpler times. What worked several years ago, in other words, probably will not work as well today, beyond China's borders at least. And although the Chinese government is working hard to extend their reach in this regard, that extension has not been as successful as it seems like they suspected it would be. And that clear intention to change the framing of these Hong Kong protests has only increased the positive attention paid to those protesters thus far. This has also become a big story because of what it represents within the world of politics more broadly. In the United States, it has served as a welcome reprieve from the left versus right mudslinging that has dominated airwaves for a good long while, allowing Democrat and Republican politicians to come together to make speeches and sign papers that condemn China for attempting to suppress good, wholesome democratic activities in places like Hong Kong. Places that legally, at least, they should not be doing that, at least not yet, due to the agreement that they signed when they reclaimed the city from the British. 
the opportunity for associating oneself with something as pure-seeming and crowd-pleasing as democratic values and free speech is not something that many politicians will pass on, especially in the U.S., where elections are just over the horizon and where political entities are doing their best to position themselves as the defenders of just those types of traditional Western values. So China serves as a welcome counterpoint here, as something to push against. And that push amplifies the existing narrative that China is the new evil empire, the modern Soviet Union, that aims to usurp all that is good and wholesome and free in the world. And that makes China an excellent punching bag for any cause that politicians and media entities to a certain degree in the West want to build a case for. This case building culminated mid-October with a piece of legislation, which was mentioned in the headline of that original article, which was passed by members of both parties in the U.S. Congress. It's called the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act of 2019, and it was originally proposed years ago, but it's been reintroduced because of the protests in Hong Kong and China's response to those protests. The legislation says, in essence, that the United States policy in this and similar matters is to support the democratic aspirations of the people of Hong Kong, to urge China to uphold their commitments to Hong Kong, and to support the freedom of the press in general. To be very clear here, China is a rising power, one that has already arrived in many ways, but which will almost certainly still get quite a bit more powerful in the coming years. And along with that increase in the hard power that they wield, the military might that they are deploying along the South China Sea and elsewhere throughout Asia, for instance, also comes a great deal of soft power. Soft power like economic muscle and cultural heft. This is the type of power that, perhaps even more, the military force has allowed the United States to become the influential entity it has been throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, leveraging economic muscle to get its way the majority of the time, and utilizing cultural influence to spread American values, American brands, American music and film and TV shows, American social norms, and American language around the world. This power is difficult to accurately measure, but pretty easy to see once you start looking for it. And part of what's so scary to a lot of American politicians at the moment is that some of this soft power is being claimed by China today. And that power transfer is allowing them to choose which cultural norms are being seen, are being promoted around the world, even in our films and in our TV shows and music and video games. China is now able to shape some of those messages, and those messages, as per the usual, are being spread everywhere, shaping the conversation about pretty much everything, and determining, at a basic level, who the good guys are, and who the bad guys are, in fictional confrontations. But also, what is considered to be normal, and what is considered to be abnormal, and even wrong. LGBTQ rights, for instance, are not popular topics in China, and censors tend to remove anything that is supportive of such rights. Over a long enough timeline, if fewer positive representations of the LGBTQ community are seen in popular culture, it could be that less positive stances regarding this community come to dominate culturally, and in turn, political positions change, and soft power eventually becomes hard power, made real by the law and those who physically enforce the law. The same is true for other values as well, like free speech, imperfect and wobbly a concept as it can often be, and liberal democratic governance of the kind that is found in most countries in the vaguely defined Western world today. If those values are relatively normal now, it's in part because of this soft power. And as that shifts toward a different norm, the reality of life on the ground could also shift. What's especially interesting to me about this whole state of affairs is that the original dream of the internet and of getting China online in the first place was that political and economic leaders around the world thought that such openness would slowly but surely bring China around to the way that everyone else was doing things, would slowly tweak their censorship and authoritarianism to the point where they were effectively behaving like the liberal democratic governments that invented and propagated the internet and other such technologies. It was thought by many proponents of getting China connected to the net that there would be a democratic revolution in China in relatively short order because of the nature of the network. Instead, it would seem that the opposite is happening, 
with China and their immense economic heft creating incentives for entities within the liberal democratic world to shift their behavior to better suit the wealthy authoritarians that are also on that network, lest they miss out on economic opportunities and their competitors claim that sprawling, increasingly valuable market for themselves. And with that situation comes the incentive to self-censor. Even without direct influence from the Chinese government, without someone storming into the boardrooms of American and European companies, telling them to get in line and stop supporting certain ideas, the leadership of these companies will often choose to do so preemptively to avoid the potential of such a confrontation. They will do what they can to predict the desires of their most authoritarian and censorship-ridden audience and create the same outcomes that they are afraid someone might force upon them if they're not careful. There doesn't seem to be a clear way around this if you're a company or an individual wanting to do business in such a country. And the Chinese government and increasingly others who share their ideas about information and news are becoming increasingly skilled at utilizing the incentives available within capitalistic systems to make those on the other end of these transactions abide by their will without them ever needing, or maybe just seldom needing, to actually crack the whip or make anything other than veiled threats, with periodic negative economic consequences for some serving as examples for everyone else. Importantly, this all takes place within the larger context of a China-United States trade war, and China's economy slowing down for the first time since their economic miracle began decades ago, and the installation of President Xi as essentially a president for life in China and a slew of moves and countermoves made by China and the U.S. politically, diplomatically, and economically in both countries and around the world. I've discussed some of these issues in greater depth in previous episodes, and there is a lot going on in this space, to the point where any time this conflict is brought up, it seems like a textbook worth of context is required just to understand the fundamentals. But understanding that there is a lot of uncertainty at the moment, and that both countries are behaving at least in part out of existential concern for themselves, with the other country seen as their main source of stress, that fills in a lot of blanks, I think. There's a good chance that by the time this episode goes live, actually, there will be other examples of this same general story happening within other industries, which can then be traced back to the same variables and incentives. But regardless of the shape they take, and how many companies and other entities become ensnared by this larger conflict, I suspect this will be a soft power-based battle that we will just have to endure into the foreseeable future. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. And if you're enjoying my work overall, consider becoming a subscriber to a new project that will be starting the week after this episode goes live. It's called Brain Lenses. It is email delivered essays about the elements that shape the way that we think about ourselves, about each other, and about the world in general. And you can subscribe to that at brainlenses.com. The video game that I would like to recommend today is called NeoCab. This is a game that you can get on your computer, your Mac or PC, through the video game platform and marketplace, Steam. But it's also available on your iPhone, if you have an iPhone, through Apple Arcade. This game is about the gig economy, it's about big technology companies, it's about humans doing the work of systems that pretend to be artificial intelligences, and it's a game that takes place in the relatively near future, and you play a driver of essentially a futuristic Uber or Lyft. You are a part of the futuristic gig economy at a moment in time where autonomous cars are replacing human drivers. And the whole game is essentially you driving around, picking people up, managing a few things like your mood, which you can keep track of using something close to a personal fitness monitor that displays different colors based on how you're feeling. And that changes the responses that you're able to make to people, but also your energy, your electricity for your car. 
and you're going around trying to solve a bit of a mystery. You've just moved to a new town, and the friend that you're going to move in with is behaving a little bit weird, and there's protests going on, anti-car protests, among others. There's kind of a transhumanist movement happening around you, and the entire game is really just you interacting with different passengers that you're driving around in your car and trying to work your way through this narrative by engaging with these people in different ways and trying to figure out what's going on around you. Now, this is a really fun mobile game. It only takes probably a couple of hours tops to finish, but it's beautifully designed. It's got great music. The narrative structure is really interesting, and the characters and the posited future that it presents is quite captivating as well. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, and if you have the ability to do so, consider picking up a copy of Neo Cab, which you can get on your computer through Steam, and you can get on your iPhone through Apple Arcade. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and I've got a couple of email projects coming up very shortly. You can find those at brainlenses.com, askcolin.com, and understandery.com if you're interested. Feel free to say hello on social media. I am at Colin is my name on most of those. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.